Because I do have some interesting things that came to mind with it. I think I think I left off with the stay-at-home son and the road to a friend's house. Um, there's another one here. Fourth shall one go, nor stay as a guest in a single spot forever. Love becomes loathing if long one sits by the hearth of another's home. Better house though I had to be. A man is master at home. A pair of goats and a patched up roof are better by far than begging. Better a house though a hut it be a man is master at home. His heart is bleeding. Who needs must beg when food he would fain he fain would have. Um, I started off with this is for the stay at home son. <laughs> or if you've taken up residence on your best friend's couch. That kind of hospitality is not bottomless. People will get tired of seeing you around their homes, especially if they're paying for everything. It is also an in-your-face reminder that you are not living up to what you may be capable of. And I get it. People fall on their face all the time. I myself have done this. But this is the foundation of the heart that is bleeding. The knowing that one has the potential to accomplish all this and so much more and yet to be satisfied accepting the handouts of strangers and the government dole. One has to wonder... What aspect of an individual that under the bridge crowd, what aspect of their being is dead to be able to live like that? There's a certain freedom in it. I mean, I'll admit there's a lot of freedom in living under the bridge. <clears throat> no responsibility, but you might get hungry. And I really don't understand how people that have a dog can handle it because I'd eat that dog. Just saying. But I look at it and I think some, some aspect of that is dead. I wonder if it dies by degrees with people that give up. Some people get so low in life, they just give up. They don't take their lives. They just wander about almost like zombies, it seems sometimes, if you've noticed the homeless in the street. They, uh, they um, and I've been awfully close to that in my life. Hmm. <clears throat> that feeling of separation from the world and the society we live in. Watching everyone go by, achieving what they are achieving, and slowly but surely understanding that all, that all these people who are doing what you cannot are also dealing with the same problems you're facing in life. That leads itself down an entire new rabbit hole of thought process. Of what did I miss? What did I, what did I not learn? What am I, what am I not? <clears throat> what am I not? Thinking, doing, feeling, seeing, whatever, the ing of ingus, that all these other people are doing this, but I can't. Why is that? I've thought that many times in life as I've, you know, been at the bottom. I've had wild successes and I love talking about them, you know, because I like to boost my ego a little bit. But I've also had very low points in my life, you know, and it's, and it's those kinds of things that, that I wondered about the most. <laughs> What am I doing or failing to do that's allowing me to enjoy what everyone else seems to be achieving with no effort whatsoever? What is it that, what is it that gives them what it takes to navigate such issues while so many others seem to fall by the wayside? Well, if you think about it, it's usually... Simple passages such as this one, gentle and not so gentle reminders from the various books of faith found in our world that tell us, get up and try again. They remind us that this pain we are wallowing in is no longer necessary. And that's a real risky thing to do, a real risky thing to grab a hold of. Because what am I going to look like if I don't hurt like this anymore? What am I going to look like if I let go of all of this shit that I'm dragging? What is it going to be like if I, if I <laughs> get that one opportunity? You, I remember a couple of years ago, somebody found somebody on the side of the road that had the perfect radio announcer's voice. And they picked him up and dusted him off and set him and gave him a contract with Kraft. And he was out there. And then within, I mean, he had all kinds of money. And then within, and they watched it. I mean, it's like, you, they, it's like the media devoured this man. They, they, they took him off the streets, polished him up, cleaned him up, set him in there, reunited him with family and everything. Had a pocket full of money. The next thing you know, I saw he was like on TMZ or some bullshit. He was up on a table with a bottle of liquor. And he, it was 
over. Just, I mean, it was a flash in the pan, a brief moment of success. <laughs> he didn't have the tools or the reminder or the support system or the group of people like we have here to say, mm, that might not be such a good idea. Let's try it this way. And I think sometimes that's what we want. You know, hospitality is a really important thing amongst us. I mean, that's part of who and what we are. Is, <clears throat> Tass just talks about it freely. It's, it's, there's, never, there's never been a more generous people. When somebody shows up at your home, you, you gave what you had. And then you went to your neighbor's house and they gave what they had. And everybody did it because they were glad to have, because there was our people. That was the tradition. That was the, the way things were. I imagine Rome was very civilized by then with polite um, attributes of society and imposition and cultural norms and all that other stuff. And for people who are spending their time surviving, for people who are not second guessing the quality of their spirituality, but embracing, making it a part of who and what they are, <laughs> accomplished people who have the ability to allow others into their home and share the best with them and without worry for what may come next. I think that's a real important sign <laughs> of the faith and spirituality of people. And I know there's a lot of knee-jerk reaction with that idea of faith, but we need to understand that this was a household thing. To be able to share the best of what you had with somebody that just showed up that you may not know from Tom, Dick, or Harry, um, hey, come on in. I got this five pound roast. Let's cook it up and let's have a feast. You want a beer? Sit down, relax, and be confident enough not to worry that tomorrow you may not have anything. Think about that level of spirituality. Think about what it takes to engage in that level of, dare I say, faith. That tomorrow your needs are going to be met just as well as they were today. And you'll have a little bit more to share with somebody else. That's a big fucking deal if we think about it in the right terms. Because so much of what we live in in our society today has to do with fear. If you, if, um, if you vote this way, you're going to lose something. Well, if you vote this way, they're going to take this from you. <laughs> um, one of them may be right, one of them may be wrong. But we've allowed ourselves to to exist in such a comfortable world that so much of the comfort that we enjoy resides in the hands of someone else who may not have our best interests at heart. There's, that's a, so when you look at these, I mean, th that's one of those stanzas you can continue to peel back layer after layer. Um, am I a good enough man that if I show up at someone's home, I'll be invited in? because there was responsibilities on the guests as there were on the host. We'll get into that in a minute too. Away from arms in the open field, a man should fare not afoot, for never he knows when the need for a spear shall arise on the distant road. You know, life is tough. Make the effort to prepare yourself. I honestly do not think such preparations can be extreme enough. <laughs> Learn how to defend yourself somehow, some way. I'm starting kickboxing tomorrow with me and Scarlett. I don't know that my body can even handle it, but I'm going to get in there and try. Um, learn how to take care of yourself. If you can't carry a weapon, be the weapon. You know, I, I saw something. I've seen a couple things that are that have me concerned. And they're concerned enough that I almost want to talk about them at length tonight, but I don't think I will go too much in depth. One is the the, the Mississippi River going dry. That's kind of an issue. Uh, barge operators and grain harvest are not moving down the river like they need to, which, okay, we can back that up with trains and semis. Well, the railroad union's about this close to going on strike. And now all of a sudden there's a diesel shortage. <laughs> These are not shaping up to be favorable for us. So when I say I don't think such preparations can be extreme enough, now might be a good time to get started on having, making sure you have enough food to last 72 hours or a month if you can, cans and water and all that good shit that goes with it. And there's a world of information out there. If you just peruse YouTube for a little bit, it'll tell you all about it. Let's see here. Let's talk about money. If wealth a man is one for himself, let him never suffer in need. Off he saves for a foe when he plans for a friend. 
for much goes worse than we wish. Yeah, the best laid plan um, always falls to shit when you engage with the enemy. That's what Pat said. None so free with gifts or food have I found that gladly he took not a gift, nor one who so widely scattered his wealth that of recompense hatred he had. Friends shall gladden each other with arms and garments, as each for himself can see. Gift givers friendships are the longest found, if fair their face may be. There's something about generosity that speaks. Well, you know, money works best in the medium it was designed for to spend. We can save and scrape by to build our fortune as we will, but the best use we can make of this physical expression of our efforts is our generosity. Don't ever short yourself. Build your future as you see fit. But remember that if you want to change the world, it's going to take some money. Your money. It is no different now than it was then. The lives of the brave and generous are best. I'm going to get further into this in a minute. <laughs> this goes into friendship. To a friend, a man, a friend shall prove, and gifts with gifts requite. But men shall mock him with mockery answer, and fraud with falsehood meet. To his friend, a man, a friend shall prove, to him and the friend of his friend. But never a man shall friendship make with one of his foeman's friends. If a friend how thou hast, who thou wilt fully trust, and good from him we get, thy thoughts with his mingle, and gifts shalt thou make, and fare to find him often. That's so important for the health of a, any kind of relationship. If another thou hast whom thou would har hardly wilt trust, yet good from him would get, thou shalt speak him fair, but falsely think, and fraud with falsehood requite. So it is with him who thou wilt hardly trust, and whose mind thou may not know. Laugh with him you can, but speak not thy mind. Like gifts to his shalt give. Young I was once and wandered alone and naught of the road I knew. Rich did I feel what a comrade I found, for a man is a man of delight. So these six stands refer to the ideas of friendship, how to be a good one, how to deal with those who might not make a full investment in, right? Because not everybody's going to be somebody you're going to bring into the fold. <clears throat> That's why I'm always cautious when people start talking about, I'm going to build a tribe. Well, one, you got to know what you got to offer. What do you, what do you, in your community, in your tribe, what's, what's, what's it look like when people become a part of that? Are they successful? Does anybody that walk along uh, get to join in? So uh, several years ago, there was a, there was a gentleman who used to be a folk builder for the AFA <clears throat> and he broke with him and he tore down the walls and he opened the doors and anybody that wanted to come can come. And it worked for the first year, the first year, Lightning across the plains had 250 people. There was the largest heathen gathering in centuries, right? This is a good thing and this is a bad thing. <clears throat> I had a good friend named Danny in Oklahoma City. He's been around a long, long time. He said that'll be the last time that works that way. Second year wasn't so good. The third year it came out that there was money being embezzled. And another group, a fairly savage group, went and scattered pig's blood all over the bay and desecrated their whole nine yards. And, and it was the whole thing went to pot. I don't think they've had a sense. There's got to be certain standards. You know, in, in the chapter where I discuss the stage of the hero's journey, as written by Joseph Campbell, we come to a point where we discuss allies. And I would be remiss if I did not point out that there is one book written by Justin Garcia entitled Tribalnomics that covers every aspect of this far, in far better ways than I can. I mean, that has got to be the go-to book when it comes to building your own tribe, period. One thing is clear, though. A man has got to have friends. We've got to have people, period. Someone he can trust and share his thoughts with. That's just the way it is. In the same manner that women need sisters, Men need brothers. The fact that they wear a hammer is not an automatic inclusion into the fold. It's like with any kind of group. I mean, at, at a certain level, at, a, at an organizational level, at the larger level, we have an obligation when somebody shows up <clears throat> to provide some kind of guidance, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that they automatically get in. There it is, yeah, perfect. It is a phenomenal book. I talked with Justin the other day. He's still got it, man. <clears throat> We've got to build an environment where, they're, where they can grow and where we can all benefit from that association. <clears throat> 
And the biggest thing that comes up with those kinds of ideas is that people get upset when somebody is in charge. That's something that has to be earned. So we got, there's, there's a lot of stuff to live up to, a lot of understanding and obligations you got to live up to. Um, well, I have read this before. The lives of the brave and noble are best, sorrows they seldom fear, but the coward fear of all things give feels and not glad the niggard gives. This is the stanza that gives us the manner person ought to be stepping into, living according to how, to all that has been said up to now in the Havamal, Mall, there ought to be a mindset developing that allows us to pursue a forthright and noble path. And there are as many variations of that as there are people, but the primary characteristic of it is, is a life of honesty with ourselves and our tribe, so to speak. Only a man who's afraid of something lies. People wouldn't lie when they have a fear of losing something. They're typically stingy people. Now that I've read this, now I feel like I don't talk about it. <laughs> anyway, we'll continue. My garments once in a field I gave to a pair of carbon poles. Heroes they seen when clothes they had, but the naked man is not. And how often do we deceive ourselves with the trappings of this modern society? We have sadly fallen victim to the dressing up of ourselves utilizing social media. And there are many times we fashion ourselves as these scarecrows. Not to mention the deceit involved in those who parade before us or who are paraded, what is real. The entirety of the story of the Prosetta is an outline of someone who has been a magician, who works with the forces of magic to deceive and empower. Yet they themselves are bamboozled when it comes, when they come upon the divine. As all of us are who, while we attempt to differentiate realities, the tales are told from the beginning so that we may learn the shaping of the world we live in and all of the forces which govern it. It is a formula to ensure that our path does not allow us to proceed naked. That's pretty good. I'm glad I wrote it. Now, here's where I picked up again. On the hillside drear, the fir tree dots, all bootless its needles and bark. It is like a man whom no one loves. <clears throat> Why should his life be long? So I thought about this for a long time before I even started writing. But when I started writing, it continued. This stands in particular should be pondered upon often. It should be examined, reflected upon, and used often to chart one's course in life. The comparison of the dead tree and the man whom no one loves creates the idea that there is a form of separateness, which creates a sense of value for everything. The dead tree is considered as a standalone entity. It is a life force spent and no longer offering food or shade for the creatures who live around it, much like the man whom no one loves. He shares not the very best essence of who he is. He offers no joy to anyone's life, including his own. With but a slight change of perception, we see that the tree, like the man, is an expression of life from the never-ending wheel of creation set in motion by the gods. The tree will provide nutrients as it falls apart, feeding other forms of life, and the man will consume and produce in a society. Kelly could be a warrior. Our challenge is to decide why we place more value on one and not the other. Or should we? Are we to consider love and life the most valuable attributes of living? They are indeed important, right? They sweeten the entirety of the mortal experience. The model and sympathy we have been taught to display over the learned feeling of loss flies in the face of an understanding of the cycle of Ragnarok. Very difficult thing to come to grips with. <laughs> it seems we have decided that the value of anything is what it can do for us. Does it benefit our being or boost our ego? To identify the man whom no one loves allows us to momentarily feel superior to this individual. We either feel sorry for him, and that comes with the innate feeling of superiority because someone does love us, or we are worth loving and he is not. We therefore feel more than this loveless individual, or we reject the person for the very same reason. The end result is still leaving us separate from the universe in which we exist. See, all of that, the loveless man and the dead fir tree and all us, is an expression of life on the surface of this planet. And we have many trappings that keep us separate from it. The floors of our homes keep us separate from it. But that's what we're supposed to be, right? This is our culture and our society and advancement technology of people. Hmm? <clears throat> But the truth of the matter is we're still no more separate 
from the flow of life across the surface of this world than a wave is from the ocean. On the other hand, if you happen to be at that point in life where you feel as if no one loves you, this is the point where you need to decide just what the value of that tree really is. Remember this transition, like all changes, are only temporary. It's all temporary. What was once a tree or person full of life will be so again. In the next season, there will be new verdant growth in the exact same spot as the dead tree. Just be patient. The world moves a little slower than we do. <clears throat> I think that train of thought is what allowed me to continue living a few times in life. When I felt like I was a man not worth loving, when I was very alone, when I was a disgrace to how I'd been raised, to my family name, to the efforts and the friendships that I had sacrificed as I fell from grace, so to speak. You know, that inherent belief, if we can get that through our thick heads, that you know what, it doesn't matter how big of a drama situation it is right now, next week, I assure you, it'll be something different. Now, the trick is, how do we make sure that it's not a repeat of last week? That's where the growth occurs. That's where beginning to understand. So let us also consider that at some point we ought to realize that the act of creation begins with an understanding of the dignity with which we perceive ourselves. If we cannot value ourselves because we feel unloved, even in a loving relationship, it's imperative that we work on these things. And this is the foundation with which all of society is built. How we interact with everyone is based on what's going on in here. I don't care if it's sick or better or well or good or perfect or enlightened or depressed or fucking evil or what. <clears throat> Every interaction we have from our children to the people we love to our parents to the people we work with is all a reflection of what's going on in here. Much of the have them all is an effort to help us create that dignity and what it should look like in practice. But it begins with us and our perception of the world. You can take an angry man and set him down and go over the have them all. And that son of a bitch is going to come out of here like the baddest warrior you ever imagined. Probably buy an axe off of Etsy to go with everything. And maybe a gun and start voting Republican. I don't know. You can take someone else who's lived an entitled life, perhaps on the West Coast, and they're going to read all of that. And they're going to dye their hair green and support every social justice movement that's going on because their holy book tells them to do that. So where do we find, how do we differentiate the balance that this book that's laid out in front of us, whose very same lessons are taught in more than one ancient spirituality and faith, these principles are not new to mankind. <clears throat> They're laid out in a way that's most palatable to the people from which the culture that they originated. You know, somebody from the Democratic Republic of the Congo has as much familiarity with what Scotty represents as Genghis Khan does with what Pele represents in Hawaii. True, the same principles are espoused there. This creates common ground for all of us. But this was written in a way that we would understand it. See, there's a, everybody has a piece of a key to allow us to move forward. <clears throat> and Freya Aswin told me a long time ago, it all comes from the same well. The interviews on my Patreon, you'll hear her say it. It's the most amazing thing. All of the have of all is teaching us how to enact in practice what it looks like to be that kind of individual that's welcomed in other people's homes, that's courageous, that's brave, that's generous. Holy shit. That's a tall order for a man to, to put upon his shoulders, for a woman to embrace. These are high-minded ideals 
of, a, of an individual confident in his abilities or her capabilities, what they're able to endure, what they're able to succeed at. <clears throat> and again and again, it centers around friendship. Does friendship five days burn? And when the sixth day come, the fire cools and all in it is the love. Hmm. Such is the way of things. When we spend the majority of our time determining the value of who we are from the input of others, it is a constant roller coaster ride. See, that's what we do when we're young. Our associations determine the value of who we are. That's, I was with this person and I was hanging out with this person and I saw this and I saw that. We find someone who lines up with the person we are in the, we, the person we are in the moment, and here we go. Soon though the veneer wears thin, and we begin to see those things about us and this other person that we may not like. Time to move on. Ask any bar, the best example of it is in the bars. Ask any bartender and they'll tell you. People hook up, it's all fun and games for about 90 days. Damn near set your clock by it. And then you see the very same people back in the bar and on the prowl. And it becomes the pattern we work with until we finally sell it for someone we may not even like. Unlike the previous stanza, this one reminds us that our perceptions create our reality. When we don't even know who we are, how will we ever determine who best compliments us? When we are spending on all of our time waiting on someone else to remind us how important we are, it can be a long, brutal wait for a train that may not be coming. As we grow older, or as we accept the guidance of our spirituality, we are reminded to step up our actions, our words, and our thoughts to the next level. And when we slowly make the shift to determining our self-worth based on what we know is the best inside us, as opposed to the opinions of others, literally everything begins to change in our world. That much I can assure you. No great thing a man needs to give. Often little will purchase praise with half a love and half, half a loaf a love, oh, it's a love. Oh, I know what love is. And a half filled cup, a friend full fast I made. <laughs> Y'all want to know what love is? If you have a trapped crawler crane <laughs> and it goes up and then the top half bends over, the way that top half bends over is described and determined in love, 20 degrees of love. <laughs> so, yes. It is always the simple gestures of kindness that round out a beautiful day. Think about that. To give with no expectation of return is the key to happiness. But Buddha is quoted as making that statement, but it's a universal truth. Think about what kind of person you need to become to accomplish such things. Try to wrestle with the thoughts that you have been given as you offer yourself freely and seek. How often have I given and had to shut down thoughts that so-and-so could be doing better? What am I doing there? I'm boosting my ego, right? I'm just making myself feel better. About my, well, they're, they're, someone might be taking advantage of me. What am I doing there? Same flip side of the same coin. Now I'm the damn victim. Or perchance the slightest hints of expectation. <laughs> just give. Try that and see, just give Try something. I don't really give a shit what it is. Try something somewhere. Just give to something. Give to someone that you know ain't worth a fuck. Right? And then see how many thoughts show up in your head. Oh, they're taking advantage. You're going to get bamboozled now. They're hustling you. You worked hard for that money. They're over there just asking for not doing anything. <clears throat> so right there, the benefit of being a gift giver is ruined. See, this is the kind of growth, the very subtle thought process, change in thought process that needs to occur to be that quality friend. To give and not expect a damn thing in return. I've got this for you. Let me tell you something. I try it. I try it all the time. Every time I give, I fucking got to think about, all right, where'd that thought come from? Oh, my dad, I remember hearing my dad say that. Okay, that's not mine. I hope they enjoy it. It's a real challenge in a society like ours. Um, 
<laughs> which is odd because we're such a wealthy damn society. We're such a wealthy society. And yet it's so difficult to give. Sometimes I don't have anything to give. You know, I live paycheck to paycheck like everybody else, mostly because I spend flippantly. But when I do have it to give, especially when it comes to my kids, yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to give you a loan, but you're going to have to pay this back. I don't give a fuck if you pay it back or not. You go, what? Am I spoiling the child? Well, it's very difficult to spoil it when you ain't always got it. Now you have to work for it. I ain't got it this time. There's a realization they got to grow too. Well, I need to do this, this, and this, but next Tuesday I can help you out. If you need it before then, you're going to have to work for it, son. That's just the way it is. <clears throat> There's a way to be steady, even if fair handed, but I digress. That whole idea of being a friend and gift givers, friends are the best, stems from that idea. If I give a gift, I'm not expecting anything. You know what I'm expecting? I'm expecting a little joy in here because I gave a gift. I was able to give of myself. It's very difficult to let go of that expectation. Because the next thought is, I better get something cool in return. No, you may not. <laughs> You're not going to get shit. Ask any beta male. <laughs> friend. You even put in the friend zone. You know, get... <laughs> All right. A little sand has a little sea, and small are the minds of men, though all men are not equal in wisdom, yet half wise only are all. A measure of wisdom each man shall have, but never too much let him know. The fairest lives do those men live whose wisdom wine has grown. A measure of wisdom each man shall have, but never let him know too much. For the wise man's heart is seldom happy. If wisdom too great, he is one. They ain't no shit. A measure of wisdom each man shall have, but never let him know. Let no man the fate before him see, for he, for so he is, is he freest from sorrow. <clears throat> I once read that wisdom is a funny thing. Wise men don't need it and fools won't heed it. Right? How much different would a life have been if wisdom had been the order of the day? How many lessons would have been missed? High adventure and excitement. What experiences that led to wonderful expression or soul-shattering pain might we have missed if we had all that wisdom to begin with? True, it might have been nice to sidestep some of the bad parts of life, but that's just the way of men. It's how we learn. A well-lived life is one that is full of challenges. Challenges always elevate us to greater things. If we got to trudge up the next hill, it's always taking us higher. <clears throat> a brand from a brand is kindled and burnt, and fire from fire begotten. A man by his speech is known to men, and the stupid by their stillness. This is one of those quotes that seems to have woven itself into the wisdom of the ages. A similar expression is found in the Mahayana Ganhuvaya Sutra translated by Thomas F. Cleary as entry into the realm of reality. It's usually attributed to Buddha, but Buddha didn't say it. Just as millions of lamps can be lit from one lamp without the one lamp being exhausted or diminished by all the lamps taking their flame from it, in the same way from the one lamp of the aspiration for omniscience, the lamps of aspiration for omniscience of all Buddhas of past, present, and future are lit. Yet the one lamp of aspiration is not exhausted and shines undiminished by the lights of the lamps of aspiration to omniscience proceeding from it. And we can be certain there are many more iterations of this concept. The sharing of wisdom and happiness by good men and women to brighten this world is a treasured thing and something you find a lot of between friends, isn't it? This is a reminder to do just that. Share the best of who you are with others and don't expect anything from it both of you will shine. <clears throat> I think that is, it always amazes me that I, I hear that. And one of the neatest things that, that kind of connected it together for me was when I, when I heard Kinos, the torch, the torch of inspiration, the idea that all of the ancestors carry that torch 
to guide us to wherever the hall of our ancestors might be. And it represents that shining light, that wisdom of all the ages before us, the path of life. <clears throat> Perhaps that's why the runes are so difficult to understand in so many ways. I, I consider them to be a description of the path of life. It is a torch. But if you understood all of it all at once, could you handle it? He must go early. He must early go forth who fain the blood or the goods of another would get. The wolf that lies idle shall win little meat for the sleeping man's success. He must early go forth whose workers are few, himself his work to seek. Much remains undone for the morning sleeper, for the swift is wealth half won. Of the many teachings that concern success, pay close attention to the ones that tell you to work your butt off. Chances are that's the recipe that will work, no other way around it. So no one really knows who said it. The quote, the successful man was out and on the job long before opportunity came knocking. And this opportunity is very often disguised as arduous work. This is what even Odin's trying to tell us. True, you do need to change your mind about a few things. But it's the strength of your back and the work of your hands that will create the opportunities we want for our lives. <laughs> We live in a society where certain segments of this, of this world have created the tools that will allow us to build enormous fortunes. Enormous fortunes. If we use our hands and our back and our mind to put enough money together to begin to work with those tools, this is what we need to do. If you want to save the rainforest, I'm going to quote Dan Pena here. If you want to save the rainforest, if you want to feed starving children, if you want to do all that, you got to have some damn coin to do it. You're not going to do it working nine to five, living paycheck to paycheck. You got to have some other money coming in somehow, some way. Doesn't really matter how, right? Stock market's the best way to do it. <clears throat> Stock markets, bonds. I bonds right now are paying 9% interest. May have changed in November. I put $25 every two weeks into that. That's going to add up. At 9% interest, you're damn right. I'm, cash app. You can buy pieces of stock with cash app. You don't have $248 or $466,000 to buy a share of Berkshire Hathaway, but you got 10 bucks, put 10 bucks in it. BHP, uh, a big mining conglomerate out of Australia, they're paying eight and a half percent interest for a dividend. So every quarter, you're going to get 8% on whatever money you happen to have in there. You're not going to get that anywhere else. <coughs> They're not going to stop mining, right? <coughs> Everything good and great that we have comes from the earth. Even the stupid fabric from this stuff, that the oil from that paint. <clears throat> came from mining, drilling, oil exploration. All of it made somewhere. Yeah, there's, do the research. I mean, I have some that I can recommend, but my Series 7 expired a long time ago. Of seasoned shingles and strips of bark for the thatch let no one know his need and how much of wood he must have for a month or in a half a year he will use. Work harder, no one cares. It's your future to build. Do it or don't do it. The choice is yours. If you know that I'm going to need, I just need two ricks of wood for the winter. That's all you're going to do. Well, let's say something changes because I like Will Rogers said about the weather in Oklahoma. If you don't like it, stick around because it's going to change, right? <clears throat> you got two ricks. Take care of yourself. Good for you. You're part of a tribe, a community. Let's say this old boy over here lost his child or lost his wife and didn't have a chance to go out there and cut as much wood as he needed. But you got enough to take care of you. Hmm. Does that sound like the best state of being for a person that wants to be your friend? Hey, uh, I'm out of, I'm, I'm burning my furniture over here. Hey, I got some extra firewood, come get it. We're part of something bigger. All of us, as much as we like to be fiercely independent in America, we're all very much a part of something bigger. 
And it really doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter what they look like. I, all these people, this lady across the street from me is Mormon. She came over and knocked on the door. She said, Brian, I don't have any food. I got you. I got some canned goods. I got some spam. I got some tuna. She may not appreciate the spam, but I do. But, but you know, that's what, I mean, that's what we do. And I don't expect anything from it. Mostly because I don't feel like talking to her again. I'm kidding. <laughs> At a minimum in life, uh, here we go. This is important. Washed and fed to the council fair, but care too, not too much for the clothes, right? Let none be ashamed of his shoes and hose. Less still of the steed he rides, though poor be the horse he has. So I'm not one of those guys that's going to be driving a new Corvette, right? Not that I can't make the payment, but, well, I think probably because there's a joke that's stuck in my head about Corvettes. What do, what do men's Levi's and Corvettes have in common? They both have a prick in them. Right. So I'm probably, you're not going to catch me driving that. Wait, fuck, that's a lie. <laughs> anyway, at a minimum in life, the first place to start building the future you want for yourself is to have the discipline to take a bath and brush your teeth every day. The rest will take care of itself if you keep trying. <clears throat> right. This is the very basics of the discipline necessary to begin incorporating discipline into the other aspects of your life. It's one of the first things they teach you in basic training, wash your nasty ass and brush your teeth. Right. And they said much uglier things than that about it. So every morning we're in there trying to hurry up and, and wash and brush our teeth and get out of there and clean everything up because it better look clean. Um, that was the foundation of, of instilling the disciplines to do all the other things that we had to do to keep putting one foot in front of the other started with, having what it takes to take care of myself, to wash my nasty ass and brush my teeth. <clears throat> you would be amazed, maybe some of you would, some of you wouldn't, of the people you come across who don't. Ugh. Listen, I can handle the smell of horse manure or cow shit all day long, but there's something about BO that I just, ugh, I can't take it. So it might be all me, I don't know, but I think that's kind of important, especially when they show up at work, all right? When the eagle comes to the ancient sea, he snaps and hangs his head. So he is a man in the midst of a throng who few to speak for him finds to be lonely in the middle of a crowd. How many of us have felt exactly like that at some point in our lives? In a room full of people we know, and yet everyone seems to be interested in someone else. Many of us may feel as if we're the black sheep of our family, black sheep, black sheep of our family, or we may not fit in at work. None of them will speak in our favor. Ever ask yourself why that is? Don't shy away from the answer. Maybe it's because you need to wash your ass and brush your teeth. I'm not talking about anybody here in particular, but somebody will hear this. This is our sign to rise to the occasion, to measure up as it were. See, all of the preceding stanzas provide us a wealth of information on how to do just that very thing, to build confidence in ourselves, to give without expectation, to be generous, to be a friend, to be that legitimate individual people find they can trust, people find that they can rely on, people know that's a good dude. That's a good woman. <laughs> All of the preceding stances are about figuring that out. And so are the remainder of them. This whole thing is to tell us how to stand up. See, once we figure out how to stand up on our own two feet and be the people we always kind of dreamed about being, and it doesn't happen overnight. It's a weird, slow transition as you're moving through life and a situation happens. And then all of a sudden, oh shit, that stanza makes sense now. But it's, it's a continual pattern of growth. It's a continuing thing. So if I go in the middle of a room and I find nobody's interested in talking to me, I'm not really taking it personal. I'll just step outside or go home or leave or entertain myself or make fun of them to their face. <clears throat> Something, anything. Um, I usually don't have a problem with it. I usually do pretty well in, in the rooms. But when I was a kid, I was painfully shy painfully shy 
you know, and you, you, your mom and dad are both enjoying whipping your ass a little too much. And those kinds of things that leave scars, you got to overcome. Those kinds of, <clears throat> sometimes that strict disciplinary thing that gets out of hand because you may have knocked over a glass of milk or some bullshit and get your ass beat for it. Um, if you get your spirit broke, it's a hard thing to get it back. You know, you can whip a child and discipline a child, but don't break their spirit. Because when they lose that, it's a very difficult thing to overcome. <laughs> and you end up with children that are painfully shy. That are that very much always feel alone. I remember one time, and I'll tell you, this is funny as fuck. Now it is. It wasn't then. <laughs> so in second grade, when my parents were getting divorced, I was painfully shy. I didn't know a lot of the kids in Kuwaita Elementary School in second grade. Mrs. Brewer was my teacher, and I'll never forget the day. And I didn't know anybody. I knew one kid. His name was Jimmy Edwards, my best friend. He, he became a football coach over there. <clears throat> but I decided I wanted my name to be Tiger. <laughs> so so I wrote I wrote Tiger on my paper and turned it in, but I didn't put Wilton on there. So sure as shit, the teacher's like, Tiger, who's Tiger? <laughs> Holy cow, I was so embarrassed. It was the most horrible thing ever, right? But I was so did not want to be who I was at that age because of what was going on at home. Those are all the kind of things we got to get through. <clears throat> so when they talk about an eagle comes to the ancient sea, snaps and hangs his head, fuck, I felt like that. And there have been times as a grown man when I'm in the middle of failure of some kind of magnificent glory that I go with the family and I really don't want to be there because I know I have not measured up. All right? I had two choices. I can either continue in that vein of thought and be bitter and angry and isolate or I can rise up to the challenge this is the first spirituality I've come to that says that shows me again and again and again and reminds me I have what it takes to rise to the challenge get the fuck up boy try harder okay the question oh, I got a note here I don't know how to open it I was listening to uh, Jordan Peterson the other day. He said something very interesting that I haven't incorporated in this yet, but I, it was important enough that I made a note of it. It says, in a social environment where there is only the tyrannical father, the benevolent mother, and nothing but the destructive force of masculine energy as it is currently being forced upon us by postmodern university types, just like communism and liberal Democrats, it sucks the vitality out of the culture. <clears throat> obviously my mind went berserk with that because I, I, I see that. I, I see that very thing happening and I'm, and I'm, I'm going to expand and expound upon that thought, uh, which is a brilliant observation. And oftentimes wonders why he makes these brilliant observations and still continues to cling to Christianity as if it is the, as if it is the truth. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. That's something to think about. To question and answer must all be ready to who wish to be known as wise. Tell one thy thoughts, but beware of two. All know what is known to three. It's one thing to know your business. It's quite another to be bragging about it. I wrote that because I, I read a Charlie Brown cartoon one time where Lucy told Charlie, those who can't do teach. So since about 2012, I've completely ignored that because I've been on YouTube or podcast somewhere talking shit about what I think I know, right? Now, here we go. Let's shift gears. If we are engaging in an intelligent conversation, it behooves us to be knowledgeable about the subject of the discussion. But like the book I said before, don't be a bragger, right? And almost certainly don't engage in frivolous conversations with people concerning said subject matters, unless they have a direct need to know about such things. The prudent course of action is to keep it to yourself. The only reason people ever bring into play such things which do not concern others is to make themselves seem more than they really are. 
The instant you tell two people, everyone knows it. That's just really the way it is, guys. Um, <clears throat> it's the way it is, especially working in a factory. These guys are, you even look at them cross-eyed and it becomes something different. The man who is prudent, a measured use of the might he has will make. He finds among the brave he fares that the boldest he may not be. Ask any serious fighter and he will tell you that there's always someone better. That's just the way it is. Right now, while we're reading this, there is someone somewhere training to kill you. At least that's what soldiers and Marines are told on the daily. Be confident, be bold about life. But once again, don't be a braggart. There are few men who can measure up to Hercules, Sigurd, or Beowulf. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try to be, but be aware that in business, love, or an actual fight, there is always someone who is going to try harder for what you, for, harder than you for whatever reason. Resting on our laurels will lead to our downfall faster than a loose tongue will. Off to the words that others one speaks, he will get but an evil gift. Some people are inherently buttholes. Treat them accordingly. Give them an inch, they'll take a mile. Sometimes they will take what you say and use those words to stab you right square in the back. So choose your words carefully or be prepared to fight over them. Now, this next one, I know I'm at the end of an hour, but this next one I'm stuck on. Oh, maybe I'm not. Too early to many a meeting I came and some too late have I sought. The beer was all drunk or not yet brewed. Little the loathed man finds. A man must be watchful and wary as well and fearful of trusting a friend. Now, that's an interesting as fuck thing to put in there. We've been extolling the virtues of having a good friend for the last hour, right? Okay. Let's break it down. A timely man is a respected man. Anyone who is overly late does so because of their own ego. Those who show up early are usually in the way of the preparations. Neither is appreciated. Most of the time, if people are honest with themselves, they will look askance at the person who is either too early or too late, right? Question at the bottom is, what are they after? Hmm, what are they doing here? Hmm, why do they show up now? Hmm. Be on time, be courteous, leave at a decent hour. Very simple thing to do, okay? Now, if you're someone who knows your friend, you understand those innate signals, the body language. You understand that stuff. And all of that can be taken care of with love. It doesn't have to be rude. It doesn't have to be formal or anything like that. It can be handled with love. If you cannot seem to muster the ability to act in a civil manner and honor the responsibilities of being a guest, it makes for a difficult recipe to need it to instill trust. That's when we're forming those friendships. So while we are blindly running early or late, we are setting a precedent for all our future interactions with others. They may smile and nod politely, but don't take it for granted if you've been abusing the privileges, okay? So to their homes, men would bid me hither and yon if at mealtime I needed no meat or would hang two hams in my true friend's house for only one I had eaten. And so the benefits of being a well-received person are revealed. They tell you the warning, they tell you don't do it, and they tell you the reward of not doing it. It doesn't matter if you're an extroverted or introverted or whatever. If you have the wherewithal to attune yourself to the details of living in your society, many of them as outlined in this book, you will discover the generosity of the culture. If you spend most of your time decrying the various injustices as you perceive them, you'll never see it. Those two standards are very important. Little of the loathed man finds, and the next one to their homes, men would bid me hither and yon if at mealtime I needed no meat, or would hang two hams in my friend's house where I'd only eaten one. See, that's the well-received man. That's the man that we've been talking about with all of these things. That's that stand-up guy. That's that old boy that's worth his salt. That fella can get it done. All of those things. Then you begin to see the benefits of society. 
the loathed man, the one that hangs his head by the sea, the one that <laughs> doesn't have any clothes, the one, the, the one that's really considering being a part of that under the bridge crowd so he doesn't have to be responsible anymore. Or the angry liberal, they will never see those benefits. I'm continually impressed by how all of these things tie together to build people into individuals who can take some of this and really, really and truly become something magnificent. This is not the easy way, but it's not that hard way. You know, if you give somebody an option to take an easy way, they're not going to value it. And a lot of the times, if you try to hit a real hardcore, serious, hardline attitude towards the, the sincerity, the, the, the legitimacy of it, and this really hardcore fascination with it, well, then you get to or like the academic or, you know, the far right. And they can kind of look, well, I take it a little more serious than you do. So you're, you're just a dabbler. So I'm just, both of them are kind of ego boosting propositions that don't really get us forward in anywhere. But this healthy middle of the road, step-by-step -step growth that's offered in this have them all is probably one of the most important, well, like it says, it is heights of wisdom that is shared with us by a noble and savage culture. I feel pretty, I'm, for me, I have kind of an attitude of gratitude for being able to come across it. And I think that makes all the difference in the world for all of us. Anybody have any questions or anything they want to comment on about it? That's a lot of stuff to talk about. No? Okay. Tomorrow's Monday. Grab it by the nose and whip its butt. I appreciate everybody coming on here. You made my night. And it's going to be a good week because of it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Brian. You, Brian. Thanks. Y'all have a good night. We appreciate it. Thanks, Brian. Good night. Kick somebody. <laughs>